Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the SoFi Weekly. Today, we have Roy and Tevis. Tevis, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. You look like you're busy. No, I'm good. I'm fully here. Okay, perfect. Uh, Roy, how are you doing? Doing good. Tevis, are you fully here, actually? Hold on one second. There we go. I'm fully here. It's uh, it's done. Sometimes I have the stream going too, and I'm like, oh man, I got the echo. So yeah, exciting week as always. Good to be here. Good Friday to y'all. Good Friday. Yeah, a little bit great, Easter. Great a little bit yeah, Easter my daughter, for me coming on after this. There was a, a church nearby that had a uh, Easter egg hunt. Um, I guess they're doing three of them at different times. And they expected there'd be 200 kids and only 60 showed up. We had to weigh the amount of candy she got off of it, eggs included, of course. Uh, Four point eight pounds of candy. <laughs> uh, crazy. I, I know there's a candy tax and everything, but it's like, oh my goodness! Like it just, you know, those uh, disposable, not disposable, reusable uh, shopping bags you can get from Walmart. That size of it was filled up to the brim. So it's just like, okay, <laughs> yeah. we'll be eating some candy. Those are the fun times, though. I mean, you got to give it to them. Yeah, yeah. While they last. Yep. Um, what's it called? So I want to talk today about some SoFi. Obviously, we'll get we'll get around to some SoFi topics. Um, but I also think that it's probably due that we talk a little bit of Robin Hood within this conversation as well, because there's been some talks that uh, Robin Hood with new product launches are going to, um, you know, leave SoFi of their customers and uh, replace us and not need us anymore because they have a, a, a credit card now. Um, but yeah, aside from that, a little bit of short, a little bit of short interest on, on the table to talk about, a little bit of um, employee talk, that sort of stuff. What do you guys want to start with first? Let's do uh, the short interest, I think. Yeah, uh, that's oh. the biggest update. Two cells, man. Two two peach vibes. I, I got a uh, match with you. Peach vibe is good. It's the only flavor that I've tried there is that it, I love. I've had like four or five flavors. Um, well, some of them are are just not great, but uh, that one's good. It, it's my um, least but, favorite, but we don't have a lot of selection here, and they sell them in variety packs, so it's part of my it's part of my inventory. Got to go through it. Yeah, we got got to tough it out so that Tevis's stock can pump. Oh, I, I know what I wanted to start with. Uh, so we uh, three months ago had a little bet uh, between us uh, in a Christmas gift exchange. If you recall, do you, do you remember that, Tevis? <laughs> you know <where> I'm going <laughs> with Tanner. So, dude, I'm uh, never doing bets again. I'm not posting any opinions on Twitter. I'm not doing any trades, any bets. Screw all of this shit. Why, is it, so, why are you so, the one that's upset? It's me that has to hold on to this shit stock. I'm the one losing money. <laughs> all right. All right. Let me share this here. Oh this is a fun one. Of course, he says this like the week after Robin Hood pumps. Dude, th look at the price. Look at the price and tell me if this is like if I peaked it or anything like that. Zoom, so, zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah, thank you. There we go. All right. So at the point when I posted this, it was 90 days yeah. ago to the T. This is coming out 180 days, 270 days. All right, so we did the gift exchange, if you remember. And so Stephen and I ended up exchanging uh, Tevis and Tanner. Now, uh, Tevis, do you remember what you got, uh, Tanner? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, that stock has the biggest discount out of all of them. So in, in a way, if he was looking to start a position. Now, are, we going, are we going golf rules? Because I know Tanner, you know, he, he mentioned something about golf score. Uh so maybe you like this, Tanner. Like, what do you, what do you think about this gift so far? So, yeah, no, I. Um, thank you. You know what? It's really good now. If I stare at my portfolio of Unity being down thirty plus percent, that there's so much more upside now that that Tevis has given me. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I personally am still hopeful. I hope honestly. I don't even want to win. I want Tevis to win because it'll benefit me more. Um, but yeah, I'm actually hopeful for all four picks. I'm hoping Steven wins because uh, yeah, he got me SoFi. And uh, at 977 is when I bought those uh, shares and uh, down a little bit, uh, you know, and, and part of that, of course, short interest Robinhood. We're going to talk about that, too. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's up a little bit. Uh, and this was not the peak from the week. Uh, that's that's a good one. I thought, and I remember telling him at this at the time. I'm like, you know, 13 is a little higher than I'd like to be. You know, you to be buying it, but you know, I think there's plenty of upside. Yeah, uh, we'll see. Anything can happen between the, now and the end. Uh, like these stocks, they they can actually move wildly. So this is not all the way over. Just something fun to pop in there, especially with Unity down that much, Tevis. Honestly, I'm Unity so glad. More, there's still a lot left in the year to go. So oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the, and the thing is, all of us, you know, we own like these stocks individually, a lot more than just like hundred dollars worth. So. Uh, Hopefully they all do well. It's a close race. Uh, we'll have to see. But yeah, that that uh, SoFi. Uh, do we want to go to the short interest next? Because that's <laughs> certainly not I, helping. I, hey, you know Thanks what, Roy? Interlude, Roy. I hope that in at the six month mark, if you're not winning, that you still post the uh, the results, regardless. Oh, I will. I will. I've got it bookmarked. I've got it saved. The one I, I have one other th of this type of post that's saved, and it's the of course the Tevis bet. Uh, on when he sold <laughs> a certain stock. Do you do you remember the stock you sold and bought more SoFi? Was that uh, was that Walmart? Still, or? Regardless of how that bet goes, I'm still gonna be like bringing it back up to surface and opening myself up to whatever the feedback may be um, next November. I think it is because I don't know. It's just. <sighs> I would it's still funny. make the trade. That's the thing. I would still make the trade. I don't. I've I, I stand I've sold that. out of uh, Palantir. Jesse Dow has sold out of Palantir. Tevis sold out of Palantir. Who gets the hate? Tevis. <laughs> uh, dude, Chris went short Palantir, and I think he got way less hate. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> I mean, we, we. It's just. It's kind of fun. But no, seriously, I've been waiting. I know, like. As a SoFi investor, I know that there's going to be a week when uh, maybe it'll be a two week period where SoFi moves up like 20% compared to Palantir. Maybe maybe that's Palantir down 5%, SoFi at 50, something like that. And I'm waiting for that week so I can be like, man, it's been a really good week for SoFi and bad week for Palantir. Let's look and see how this race is doing. And it's still, it's not good. But it's that week hasn't happened yet. I, I'm hopeful as a SoFi investor, it's got to happen. But no, those are the only two things. I'll I'll post, you know, no matter what, see how they're doing. Not trying to like rub anyone's nose in it. Like honestly, SoFi is not. Uh, it, it surprised me just how weak the stock has been this year. Um, how high that short interest is. Um, Robinhood. My base uh, scenario uh, for target for the end of the year was twenty six. I mean, it could hit twenty six in three weeks. I I, I don't know. Uh, Palantir is stronger than I thought. Like you just never know. I thought Unity was a good deal. I thought all these stocks when we were exchanging them that they were fair. Like you, you don't know. Um, anything can happen in short term. It's not always rational. Um, like that short interest for SoFi. Yeah, you. I mean, you also don't know, right? Like because these things have moved so aggressively in such a short period of time that it's like it's scary even at this snapshot to make a call for the year. Right, because there's going to be so many macro events that we have coming up towards the end of the year as well, with our first rate cuts, uh, with the presidential election around the corner. Like, who knows what might happen in terms of just because something is up like a hundred percent in the first month of the year doesn't mean that it's going to end the year up a hundred percent. It could end it up the year two hundred percent, but it could also not. You know, like so. I don't know. I just. Like a year is a long time when you think about it. Um, if you remember, like last time, last year at this time, SoFi was at $4 and it went to $12, like in a matter of two weeks. And that's like a 3X. And so just that move alone, you know, if we'd made that bet last year, it's like I would have wanted to bet because that's the thing or that's the, I mean, I don't want to rehash this, but. That was the idea with the Palantir bet because SoFi, let's say if it went from four to 12, that's a three X Palantir would have to then go to like 50. And so that's like so much more difficult to achieve because of the market cap. Um, at least that was the idea. But my point that I'm trying to make is these things can move up or down in a hurry. And so you never really know when you're calling something out 12 months. That makes oh, yeah. a lot of sense. Honestly, I just, um, with that rationale, why did you give me Unity? Because you didn't own it. I thought the rules were you have to have something you don't own. 
That's true. That is true. Steve, That's the rules that I thought we were doing as well. But, and then, yeah, yeah, that's why I got PayPal. And then Steve came in last second. He's like, SoFi. I was like, dude, we're literally on a podcast with SoFi in it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I own it. So. Every, everyone should have just given everyone New Bank or something. But um, I would have loved New Bank, man. You should have just given me that instead. Hey, you, you, I think at the time, uh, I, I think because I couldn't or you couldn't purchase it on Wealth Simple at the time. Yeah, something along those lines. I made some comment about New Bank and why I wasn't giving you it, but um, I'm going to do a white balance really quick because yes. I'm, I'm in December really it was uh, in December it was way less. It was like six or seven dollars, right? Like New Bank would have been winning by a long shot um, yeah. in that time span. Yeah, maybe not. Uh, I'd have to see where it is. I think Hood might still be ahead, but it'd be very close. Uh, I remember. Thinking Celsius would be an interesting pick for Steven, and I mentioned that. It's done a lot better than I thought, uh, and I'm not in that. So congratulations, by the way, Tevis. And uh, Cheesecake Factory, just because I know that guy likes dividends. I mean, that it, it's it's a dividend stock. It's not going to move up rapidly. But, yeah, what you said, especially when there's short interest this high, it adds a measure of volatility to a stock. And SoFi is already volatile, even when it's not uh, heavily shorted like this. So, there absolutely could be a very short stretch of time, uh, depending on the catalyst, depending on what's happening in the macro, where SoFi moves up very, very violently. It could move down violently too, but we're already at a point where I think that that becomes less and less likely. So like trying to compress something further and further, and the more you compress, the harder it gets. So uh, we'll have to see. Um, it's just it's an interesting thought experiment. Uh, I think it's good to revisit, you know, once a quarter. So. Um, I still think Robinhood will win just because it has that colossal lead and all the catalysts this year. But I think it'll be a, a more interesting race than it is right now, for sure. I don't think it's going to be a blowout. Yeah, look, I, I think there's such a huge recency bias because what I've been seeing with SoFi ever since they did the convertible note offering at the beginning of March, the stock's been so flat. Like after it fell, it's been so flat. You know, it's this week alone it closed literally like 7:30 it opened 7:30 it closed and it moved up to you know 7:60 it moved down to 7:20 and that was the range it was like a 40 cent range and the week before that i think it you know was like up 1 or 2% or something for the entire week and there's been no volume it seems like but and so as a result of that people like I'm seeing on stock twits on Twitter or whatever, people are saying, Oh yeah, like on a good year, so if I could close at twelve dollars, or on on a good year, so if I could close at thirteen. Meanwhile, in December, uh, we were like, Oh yeah, so if I twenty dollars, I think I was the most bearish at twenty, and you guys were like all twenty plus. And I, I, I still I still hold that. I think that um well, so one one caveat that I that I want to specify, I want to see four quarters. So yeah. Sometimes I, I get confused in my own head because I'm thinking, okay, well, we'll see Q4 numbers by then, but actually by end of year, we, we won't. Um, yeah. By January. But yeah, by, by, by end of January, I do believe <clears throat> in that price target. I think that the $12 ranges are so silly. That yeah, was based well, on... So sorry, I, I just want to just clarify just really quick that if there is some intrinsic value to a stock that there's always a range on both sides, like that sort of standard deviation between uh, undervalued and overvalued on the stock, and, and stocks can hover in those ranges. Um, and they should go off of some fundamental analysis. People yeah. that are saying $12 is just, you're not including the idea that that people could be bullish on the upside of this company and a company actually reaching a much higher potential on the other side. So, um yeah, I'm I'm absolutely still in that same price range. Yeah, this is why and, and, I said the recency bias because this thing, even at the beginning of this month, was like at nine dollars, and you know by the end of Q1 earnings, it was at ten dollars. And so for people at that point to say twelve dollars by the end of the year, it seems like such a conservative bet. But now because this thing has fallen down to 750, they say, oh yeah, $12. And so it just hovers between like plus five, minus $5 of whatever the stock price is trading at for the estimate for end of year. 
And my whole point that I'm trying to make, and you know, with with Roy's bet and the the Palantir SoFi uh, trade and all that, is to say these things can have unpredictable moves, especially mm-hmm. when you pack in the short interest, when you pack in the awareness that happens when a stock breaks out the 52 week highs. Like SoFi is going to break out of 11, I think it's 1170, and after that point, all the algos are going to pick it up. All the news are going to pick it up because it's it's past 52 week highs, you know, two straight quarters profitability, whatever it may be. And there's a renewed sort of momentum in that stock. And you're seeing it with Hood right now. It was the most hated, ugliest piece of shit stock on the market. And then it didn't didn't matter that they had six billion dollars in cash or whatever. This thing was a seven dollar stock. Nobody wants to touch it with a 20 foot pole. And all of a sudden at $20, they're like, should should, should I, is it, is it a, a good time to get in? Like, is it too late? Like, should I buy more? And I'm just like, guys. And so this is the thing. It's like sentiment follows price and that cuts both ways. And so if SoFi does go to 10, 11, 12, whatever, there could be a second win to, to push it up much higher because sentiment follows price. In other words, I'm still going to hold true as much as I can to say that that bet is still going to be competitive, more so for SoFi Palantir rather than Unity, but we'll see. I I don't like using the examples of Robinhood and Coinbase and these sort of very volatile stocks because uh, things have changed in very momentous ways where people are betting on, um, you know, potentially larger cryptocurrency markets or these sorts of things, so they're placing future bets. I do like, however, the um, change in sentiment on a firm because there really wasn't a massive switch in a firm that made sentiment change other than people were like, oh, wow, your ability to just stay consistent was way more, uh, way higher than expectation in terms of a surprising to the upside. And in the last 52 weeks, Okay, the stock has seen a low of $8.80 and a high of $52.48. Yep. And there was no real change. Uh, I mean, they continue to put out great quarters, right? There, there was real fundamental change, but that's exactly what SoFi is doing as well. So there's massive sentiment, similarly with what we saw in a firm before, where saying, hey, we don't understand how they are going to outperform on delinquencies and these sorts of things. Our new members are going to be able to come in. Our deposits are going to slow. Uh, other competitors are going to catch up. All of these uh, things that people could point to very similarly to a firm, but you have to look at you know sort of the trends. And if SoFi can hold up what they've been doing for the last many years, uh, then I believe we're going to see an amazing spike like that. So people are saying, uh, even in the chat right now, twenty dollars would seem surprising. Yeah, well the you know, over 5x in a firm's price in a single year, just based on linear growth, also was very surprising. Things go undervalued and things go overvalued. And the thing to add to that is that don't forget, this thing has been flat for like three years, basically, like range bound in that $3 spread for like three years. Um, You know, since it fell in early 2022, it fell from the 20s. This thing has been in the mid 20s before when it had much poorer financials and it's formed a very solid base of accumulation everybody i mean across the board bearish neutral or bullish would tend to agree that we're towards the lower end of the range for sofi rather than the higher end of the range right other than gary gordon there's not a lot of people who would say that it's overvalued right now most people would say it's undervalued so no matter when what do you guys think needs to happen in order for that sentiment to change I think part of it was, you know, just the vested interests that uh, institutions had on on that senior convertible note offering. That the sure. lower the price went, um, the better it was for them. And so certainly there was. It's not really manipulation. Like it's it's well, I mean, it's manipula- manipulation the same way as buyers when they buy the stock, basically. But they uh, there's always that pressure. Uh, Noto mentioned it in the Kramer interview that there's a five percent or to 10% uh, drop in the stock price. We saw a lot more than that in SoFi though, uh, Mm -hmm. just in that kind of offering, just because of that nature. People are greedy. They want the best price possible. Um, That has been alleviated partly. Um, I think a lot of its stocks, especially right now, are very narrative driven. They always are, uh, but far more so right now, I believe, than fundamentals. 
Uh, that's not super abnormal, but I did a, a kind of a thought experiment uh, today uh, on a post on X where for me, I, th I was thinking of flipping the stock on the head. So we, we've seen the execution that SoFi has done. Uh, and so I was like, well, what if there's a stock that was a polar opposite? And so, you know, it's a stock that instead of being down 25% of the year was up 25% of the year, yet they had a long a period of gap profitability. Then then they actually became unprofitable and then they guided to be unprofitable all year. Uh, the EBITDA is declining by 30% in 2024. Subscriber or customer count down 44%. They, they're going from multiple vectors of income to one. And even in that one, they're only growing 5%. They're, uh, and they're shrinking rapidly in the others. The CEO has sold the stock a number of times. The guidance uh, has always been really aggressive. And they almost always miss it with the exception of this last quarter. It's basically the opposite of SoFi. And just going all the way through these. If you look at this. That kind of stock sounds like an amazing shorting opportunity. It really does. Like you would need to know more information. You wouldn't go just based off of this. And so I asked people to identify it and let me know like what they might do with it. Uh, and I think one person maybe not so seriously mentioned SoFi, but it was all over the place. And it was really hard to identify just based on that information. But it's ethos, the opposite of SoFi. And I think the narrative is that SoFi is many of these things when, in fact, it is the polar opposite. And so myself, if I saw an ethos that was like this, that was so terrible, I would be very tempted to buy naked puts and just be like, hey, I think these are going to print. There's no reason the stock should be up 25 percent. It makes no sense in this kind of environment, even in the middle of a bull market. And so as strong as I feel about that, it's like it, the opposite is also true, that SoFi is fundamentally strong. It's not perfect. There is always a risk for downside. And I'm like, hey, it's it's a buy. Uh, I'm going to keep buying it. Um, so it can be helpful to do that uh, sort of exercise just to kind of break out of the narrative and use a, a, a metaphor analogy like this just to remove your biases from the equation, you know, removing SoFi name from the entire equation and just say, hey, what do you think about this company? And so hopefully that helps. But it takes time too. like just people you know, naturally are pessimistic. I saw a lot. Did you guys see a lot of capitulation or people mentioning that they were capitulating your feeds this week? Or I, I didn't see much of anything like that. No, I, I saw a number of people. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I'm not a For mostly so a guy, guy, like, no, like that they were, they were saying they're selling their whole position, half their position, um, that they were waiting until the pump to eight and then they'd be out entirely, or they just wanted to get back to nine and be done with it. Um, that Noto was a terrible seat. It just, it yeah. went on and on. And it's like all of us and, and said, I'm selling my position. You know, I've been here for a while. It's not moving and this and that. And, and Who, I who's like been saying this? Just some followers, some viewer of the channel. And I, I just feel like the longer that this goes, the more aggressive people become and the more they dig their heels into whatever respective camp they're in. Because when this guy posted, hey, I'm selling, a, you know, at seven dollars and i'm gonna go into hood be, or whatever people were like okay you know good luck and then other people were like you're right you do it like this is a shit stock and this and that and just it was so like polarizing um it's just i don't know man it's it's getting to that point where the longer it stays like this and uh, the more culty I, I i guess i would say or the more adamant people are bullish or bearish there's yes. less people in the middle it's this it's yeah. the same thing every single cycle with with sofi though it's goes up way too much <clears throat> all the people that said they sold never never come out of the light anymore right they all completely fade it fade away and it's probably the exact same people that are saying oh my god i can't believe i hold i'm such a winner jokes on you guys now youtube actually saves your comments so um you know, I, I brought up some dude. Uh, he's in the chat, actually. I won't I won't shout him out again. But uh, he was talking about going all in on SoFi. And then all his latest posts have just been bashing SoFi. I'm like, dude, come on. Like, let's be real. Uh, anyway, I this is the same thing that happens every single time. People, whenever things get uh, bad, they say, oh, my God, I'm selling. And then whenever things get super hot, they go, oh, I, I cannot believe that I bought so much whenever it was so low. And or I didn't buy enough and these sorts of things whatever whatever yeah, it's 
it's it's at uh, market cycle psychology. It's it, it's exactly the same. It is for every single stock. Um, some more so than others. You know, some just keep going up, and that's it. Um, but that's not normal. Like even the best stocks will have times where it's pressed way down below where it should be, um, and it just it's not wrong to sell just because you know you're feeling like you should sell. Just you know, um, it like if you're not being able to sleep at night, you have too much tied up in SoFi. Um, it's causing you health issues, mental health issues, whatever. That might be a perfectly valid and good reason to sell, honestly. Yeah. Uh, or you might look at SoFi and be, and be like, you know, I, I never thought about the downsides. There's downsides to every single stock. Uh, I think Gary Gordon, I don't know if that's a real one in there. He pointed out with some. Uh, I think he's wrong uh, on most of them. Uh, but there are some things that he points out that are legitimate arguments. And so you need to weigh both sides, weigh both cases. Um me, I've found that I I can be feeling a certain way towards a stock, but I, I can't make decisions based on feelings ever. That's just a trap because you get stuck in the, oh, I'm going to take like with Robinhood right now. I've taken out, you know, my initial gains uh, more so. I've taken out profit as well. And I'll do that again at like 25 or 26. I've, I've got a target right around there. Uh, if it gets to that, like no guarantees. Even if I feel at the moment like, hey, this thing can go to 30, 35, 40, 45. It's like I, I've made this plan. Unless the data actually changes, I'm going to take gains at that point. I have to. Uh, and, and with SoFi, same thing. Is like I'm not loving SoFi being down in the dumps. I don't love seeing uh, it down 25% when we're at all time high after all time high. It's frustrating. But I look at the company. I see the same things that I've done, and I so I know up here, like, hey, this is to me only to me a screaming buy. And so I keep buying it heavily, even more so than than Tesla, which I've, I've been glad to buy that position and fill that out as well. Um, do we want to move on to uh, what other topics? So short we, interest. Yeah, we didn't even talk about the short interest. That was the catalyst that started this whole price discussion and sentiment discussion. And we just that didn't actually talk about the actual short interest. The news is on Wednesday, NASDAQ updated their numbers per March 15th filing. And short interest for SoFi is 209 million shares sold short, an increase from the 154 million in the beginning of March. So it's a record, all time record for short interest for SoFi. Uh, Fintel reported this was 23% of short. It might actually be slightly lower because of the new shares that were issued and the float is essentially higher, but still a staggering amount short. And yeah, just seems to be increasing every couple of weeks. Uh, for reference, in January, at the beginning of the year, so the January 12th filing, the short interest was about 118 million shares. So basically, Short interest has increased 77% roughly year to date. And that's yeah. like <laughs> what has happened from then until now. We reported the first quarter of profitability. So, um, yeah, people are going to place bets. That is not one thing that I think. Uh, is determinant of how I look at the company. I mean, I'm going to do my own research, and uh, there's a group of people that I like to uh, talk with and, and read their comments about SoFi. And um, as long as you see all angles, you understand the risks. Other people's opinions of stocks are very hard to uh, change your opinion, or at least th th that should be the case. Um, yeah, I I'm I'm holding strong. I cannot wait to see Q1. I think the thing that's going to kill shorts is if earnings uh, earnings expectations continue to get revised to the upside. If they if SoFi comes out and say, "Hey, well, uh, revenue by end of year is going to be slightly higher than we expected. EPS is going to be slightly higher. EBITDA is going to be slightly higher than we expected." That's going to have to have all the analysts reprice what they think SoFi is going to do by end of year. And my expectation is that that happens at least three or four times throughout the year. Um, that is how, in my opinion, we get to that $20 price. Historically speaking, uh, analysts have blown me away by their expectations. Um, 
continuing to hold or bet against Anthony Noto, regardless of multiple, multiple times of, of outperforming. But that, that story can't go on forever, right? What's that quote that uh, Warren Buffett always likes to quote? Like, uh, um, The market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. No, like well, no, I was going to, the, uh, um, what can't go on forever will end. <laughs> there you go. It's pretty simple, but it's important. <laughs> it, it both really come into play. Um, at some point, the fundamentals do matter. Um, they, they just do. You know, narrative always matters. That narrative can switch at a dime. We've seen it again and again in the last year. Um, a year ago, Palantir shareholders, myself included, it was just dismal. And there's been fundamental execution, acceleration, a lot of interesting things happen. This is not Palantir Weekly, but there's a reason why it's up at, at, at the price. And I actually think it's a fair price, by the way, but we're, we won't go there. But SoFi is like the opposite. And it is very odd for a mid cap that is profitable and is not burning money, uh, that is accelerating in growth uh, to be shorted in, uh, at 20% or higher. It's very unusual. I looked so, up and pulled up a list of stocks that were shorted in that range. SoFi is surrounded by a lot of small caps and micro caps and biotech companies that they're always risky. They, they either go to zero or they go to you know hundreds just because of the nature of, of those animals. And, it, and they burn money all the way through. It's just like, okay, SoFi is not any of these things. So it just, it doesn't add up, but it wouldn't shock me if, you know, we only see that data. It's a lagging indicator. If there's been some covering since then, maybe not much just because we see where the price is. Uh, but that might be the highest ever that we see for SoFi. But I keep thinking that I'm like, yeah, I probably won't go up too much higher. Hey, maybe we'll see 25% next month. If they want to send this stock down to like $5, $4, $3. The, if nothing is fundamentally changed in the company, there's been a few shifts. You know, the dilution was a thing. Um, we don't want to ignore that. But if nothing is fundamentally changed, the lower the price, the better the deal you have if you're buying that. It's frustrating if you're holding it and you can't buy the dip. I get that. But just think of it like a, you know, the Tesla. If you if you want to own a car, a vehicle, you want to buy a Tesla, and the price gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper on the same exact vehicle and nothing else has changed on that vehicle, you shouldn't be like, eh, I don't know if it's a very good deal when it was, th it's 30,000 before, now it's 25,000. Something must be wrong with it. It's like, well, double check that vehicle, but you might have just saved yourself 5,000 bucks. So yeah. Let me, yeah. let me see if I can, just for the sake of argument, take the other side of that, um, of that sentiment. What we know for sure is... <laughs> Tenor's t-shirt. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> this is a freaking cult. What's going on here? Uh, Tanner's. Oh, um, anyways. Uh. <laughs> I think that's probably the same person that I don't actually think it was Gary Gordon that was in the chat. I just think people are getting his profile. They're just <laughs> crazy people. Okay. Hold on. Let me recompose. Um, <laughs> so, okay. What we know for sure is we know that the management team is incentivized to get the stock to a certain value by mid 2026. There is no guarantee. There's nothing that's set in stone that says that they have to get the stock by that range in 2024 or in 2025. And a lot of the counterpoints that I've been seeing, obviously dilution is a, is a big one. You know, um, They're improving the EPS numbers. I, I saw this one, um, this one post where they basically said, hey, well, in order for institutional ownership to go up, they have to buy from retail. They're incentivized to buy from retail lower. We have talked about this manipulation in the past in the short term. Part I mean, Anthony Noto mentioned it on Kramer himself. You know, short uh, investors are shorting the stock as a form of delta hedging for the convertible notes. And so there's a lot that goes on in the short term that manipulates the stock price that has nothing to do with the actual underlying fundamentals of the company that detaches those two things over the course of, let's say, this year. And so I could totally, and even mentally preparing, I could totally see a year where we could have 2024 come to an end and so if I could still be at uh, the under $10 range, regardless of having four quarters of profitability, I guess then it just becomes a conversation of how much do we put on uh, retail investors 
to single-handedly drive the stock price up while all the institutions are shorting it down and trying to suppress the stock price to maybe accumulate in the background or whatever that may be. Like my point that I'm trying to make is there could full on be an explosion of the stock upwards, but we're not guaranteed that that's going to happen in 2024 at all. Sure. Like there's nothing out there from a narrative perspective, from a incentivization perspective that should shoot the stock up. Um, you know, we could have cores of profitability. I think that's the main argument that we're all hinging on right now is to say, well, if they beat analyst expectations, then they should go up. And yeah, like in a one dimensional argument, they should. But when you add all of these other layers of incentives from an institutional perspective, hedge funds, whatever, it becomes a much more complex equation. Like I'm trying to justify in my mind how a name like this has such a high short interest to start with. And once I eliminate the actual like holes in the fundamental thesis, then I start thinking to myself, okay, well, what are the other benefits of having such a high short interest? And what are the other ulterior motives at play here? And how does that play into the potential for the stock to go up or down? And so, I don't know, it's something I, I guess worthy of us talking about because we're looking at the stock predominantly, I would say 80 or 90% of our conversation focuses on the underlying fundamental business execution. But what has SoFi proven to us so far that that single layer of the business executing does not translate to the stock price going up in the short term. And yeah, I mean, I think we can all agree in the you know next two years or next three years that the stock price will eventually close that gap, but we're not guaranteed for that to happen this year. So I think it's important to understand, I think that a lot of the people that are making shorts are not just necessarily betting against SoFi in particular. Whenever this is uh, makes up a large percentage of your portfolio, people are saying, hey, why SoFi go up? Why SoFi go down, right? Rather than, hey, why are interest rate sensitive stocks going up? Why are interest rate sensitive stocks going down? Um, and I think that there's a more macro, like sometimes we zoom in so close that we're looking at, um, you know, this boat of SoFi trying to navigate the waters and, and they're doing great things, but the tides are shifting in their favor or away from their favor. Um, and those sorts of things I don't think are given enough credit, uh, at least at, on YouTube. Um, I think the important thing that people need to realize is that why are you holding this company? What are you holding it for? Um, is is it to make a three month gain or is it to make a multi year gain? Right. Um, everyone keeps asking me. They they ask me like every multiple months. They go, Hey Tanner, you need to update your your price target for twenty twenty or twenty thirty for SoFi. It's like I don't think you understand the point of that video. It's a twenty thirty price target. We'll see if I'm right. I like. You know, I, <laughs> I I don't want to change that at all. My expectations back then are my expectations today. And uh, the the short-term bumps is not what uh, people get right. Like, like the way I sort of projected it was in a linear scope, but that doesn't mean that what happens in between those two points is going to be linear. And you can see massive lows and massive highs, and there's going to be lots of fluctuation. Um, that's hard to, to talk about. I want to call someone out really quick uh because i saw a comment that i think a lot of retail investors can really relate with where they say um you know stop talking about sofi having a short squeeze the shorts are winning well what the hell does that even mean you know like how do they win at what point do they win if the, if if we get 90 plus percent short interest and the stock goes down to two dollars a share do they win like or do i just buy more shares i mean what in the what part of the shorting of the company makes that the uh you know the business deteriorate at a faster rate or something along these lines there is negative impacts if we have to dilute or something like this um but there's no winning here for shorts and the longer that they wait for seven to go down to six or five that it's costing them money to do so so let them make their bets i actually really appreciate roy he he typed out saying uh or the same person said you know tell your brokerage not to loan out your your shares and roy i'm totally with your opinion here well no i'm actually going to keep 
lending out my shares. <laughs> Make your money, Roy. I do the exact same thing. That is not yeah. the way to combat them is to stop you know, lending out your couple thousand shares. Okay. That is not going to make a difference. They're, they're, they're short two point or sorry, 209 million shares. Your thousands of shares is not going to change anything. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, some people get a little bit crazy about the manipulation stuff and want to fight back and you're spending your own dollars to do so. Let them have their fun. If you're a long-term investor, I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> like, it's it's whenever the company actually deteriorates. And maybe that's why I respect some of the comments about Gary is because he's not talking about the stock price. He's talking about how he thinks the company is going to deteriorate, right? Which is fair to him. I don't believe it, but at least we're not talking about the you know fluctuations in the company. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah the, the price can do anything. Uh, it's going to move up and down violently. Um, I you know I've. I was asked there, you know, if I'm selling covered calls on it too, and I see several others are not just because it's down low. The premiums are not there, even though the volatility is. Um, and I, I personally don't sell covered calls at a price that I would be very unhappy uh, if it was, if it actually went into the money and that can happen in a hurry. It might not, but it's not worth the tiny, tiny premium that I receive versus me lending out my shares. If someone wants to borrow them, I actually need to check. I've not looked in the last few weeks. I'm sure that somebody's been borrowing them and I made that, you know, a few bucks. Uh, and I just keep throwing that in SoFi. I like the price. Um, I, I did an article at the beginning of this week, I believe it was, uh, or it might've been the tail end of last week on whether SoFi was actually a squeeze play. Um, and, you know, I, I've been involved in that. My second highest gain ever, uh, actually Robin that I think uh, eclipsed that. Um, third highest gain ever was in the AMC days. You know, I, I did a, uh, a quick 4X with a large amount of my position um, it was, you know, there's, it was risky then. Um, those are not the times we're living in right now. Uh, it is, uh, any stock that's, has, had is shorted this much, but that's not why I'm ultimately in SoFi. I just view of it at ultimately as a free call option, call option that I don't have to pay for that can absolutely print, uh, even though I didn't have to do anything but buy shares. And if someone wants to borrow them, so be it. They're still mine. Tevis? Yeah. I mean, I think all of the disagreements that people have over SoFi or that, you know, we're seeing two things. Number one, if we subscribe to that Warren Buffett idea of like, hey, you're going to buy a farm, you're not going to check on the price of the, you know, farm every day. You're just going to sit tight and ride that out. But we don't live in that vacuum. It's compared to all the other opportunity costs in the market that you could have invested in. And as a result, you get to like, that's the introduction to the emotional aspect of it. You either yeah. get ridiculed for holding SoFi when I could have been all in on Palantir and then Palantir, you get ridiculed because you could have been on all in on NVIDIA and then NVIDIA, you get ridiculed because you could have been all in on Bitcoin. It's like, dude, when does it end? And so well, I, I don't think anyone gets ridiculed for their stock picks other than the people. It's like, it's a, so it's like whoever is the most successful with their returns people view them as smarter than or that they had some type of alpha or wow, like they're so successful because they see this like time frame, but it's never ending because there's so many different alternatives. Number one, number two, all of those disagreements with let's say one stock, particularly let's take SoFi, all of those disagreements, in my opinion, are disagreements on time frame because shorts can win. Yes and longs can win it's just a matter of time frame you know um, yep. somebody who's making the trade can win somebody who's doing a long-term investment can win and so for me to disagree with i don't know somebody in the chat that says sofa is not going to go to 20 or whatever it's just a matter of time frame like yeah it might not go to my price target next year but it might go there in my time horizon that i'm looking at it because i'm investing for the long term and they might be trading it and so where they're frustrated i'm excited because there's an opportunity for me to keep accumulating and those discrepancies happen all the time in the comment sections it is kind of annoying that uh that that's where the sort of conversation has led to though it's just like price action and how to stomach it um if i can just give you guys some advice like what teva said pick the time frame in which you're going to be investing in and then have some freaking stomach not brains just stomach <laughs> and and listen to a couple warren buffett interviews to calm yourself down um 
Yeah. Dude, and, and just revisit, listening or just reading before you get into this game. Revisit why you got into the stock. Like if it, if you were following someone else in the trade and you didn't do the homework, learn from that. That's on you. Don't do that uh, because stocks, when they go down like this, you don't have the, the conviction. You haven't actually done anything. You don't know if the person that was saying, hey, it's going to do this or I like this uh, stock for this reason is right. But if you've actually put in some time and you put in some uh, money in a position, like we're not talking about like you put in a hundred bucks in Dogecoin, like whatever. Uh, but if you put some some of your hard earned cash, a considerable chunk of it on a stock, you owe it to yourself to do your own due diligence, not just listen to us, uh, you know, do pull up those earnings calls, uh, listen to those, look back into the earnings report, see what other people are, are saying and make sure that it's right. And then that allows you to build that stomach uh, so that if it goes down, you're like, OK, Nothing has changed in my my thesis, my narrative. And so this is actually a deal. And you know that versus, you know, and the other way too. Like if SoFi ran up, we talked about this as a possibility at the end of December that if uh, SoFi was bought out or if it ran up to like 20, I don't know what price we put it, but like 25 bucks, 35, 30 bucks, all of us would have been out at that point, like in January. Just like someone wants us to give, give, give us 30 bucks in SoFi. We think that's an amazing company that long term it will be above 30 bucks. But realistically, at that point, it's like, man, I, I'd probably hold on to just a little bit out, out of sentiment, like 100 shares. But the rest of it is like, OK, there's so many opportunities in this market and ways to make money. Um, I'd sell at that point. I still would. If, if we squeezed and we're popping up to 30 bucks, I'm gone. I'll keep 100 shares. Sentiment, you know. Look, I, at the end of the day, I know Tanner said it's frustrating and I understand the frustration. But it makes me really happy that we're having this conversation and it's being recorded and there's hundreds of people watching because the way that I view it, this is a real time case study in how to handle that volatility. Because a lot of the people that are watching right now might be younger investors that just entered their first bull market or maybe they entered during the downturn. And I think that you learn way more from SoFi. I mean, the, the one bear in my chat basically said it's been flat for the last two years i think you learn way more about how you handle your risk tolerance how you handle your stomach how you handle your volatility for a stock that's been flat for two years and how is your reaction to that are you truly long term can you put that to the test rather than if i entered the market for the first time ever and i just threw a dart at a dartboard and it happened to land on nvidia and this thing goes up 10x and oh my gosh this investing thing is so easy everybody else is an idiot for not doing this everybody is going to learn that lesson sooner or later that not everything goes up all the time forever and it's just a matter of you know sofa is one of the companies where we've drilled as many holes as we can on the actual fundamentals of the business and now it's just a waiting game for the stock price to catch up to what the fundamentals are uh, for that valuation right and having these conversations about dealing with the emotions throughout that wave like the stock doesn't owe it to you to be up man tesla was flat for like 10 years and look how it worked out for those investors a lot of them made life-changing money and you know what about if they had sold during that time if they couldn't stomach that volatility if they couldn't stomach the fact that there's opportunity cost in the market and everything else is going up and your stock is not going up and so everybody's running their own race. And I think it's important to have that conversation because it provides a perspective that not a lot of people will see if it's their first bull market that they're ever coming into. And I, I think that's important because I think Tesla is the best example, at least that um, I've lived through where that stock was one, the, heavy, the heaviest shorted stock on the stock market before 2020. Uh, had plateaued in price around the $50 billion market cap uh, range for quite a long time. And then as it started to shoot up, you could see these uh, moments where people were having heavy sell-offs and people were jumping out of or jumping out of the ship because they were going, oh, it's headed back down to that sort of uh, band that it was in before. Not realizing, like, that's why I don't really believe in these sort of uh, trading blocks and potentially they are are true, but... I find that they do more harm than good because they could potentially get you out of a stock that is a much longer term grower than, you know, just the cycle that we're in today. 
uh, I don't think that it's healthy to find stocks, be in them for 18 months and jump ship and then find another company. It's like, I just don't believe that investors are that good to continuously find new investments over and over and over that, that win. And if you look at some of the best investors in the world, what they usually say is that, hey, we don't have great track records for picking stocks, but whenever we land them, we don't sell them. And that has led to some of the best out, out, uh, like outperformance because they are compounding. And real compounding comes from holding. And I think the problem that people are going to get in because of the way that SoFi has acted is that if it does go up to 12, you're going to see people uh, take, take profit. And, and perfectly good. I hope that you know people are comfortable uh, with that amount of gain, but I'm not. That would be um, a loss, in my opinion, because it wouldn't have outperformed the S&P 500. So uh, I'm, I'm looking for much more than that, and I think that SoFi has that in them. But anyway, that's just for me. Can we talk about these executives leaving for just a couple of minutes? Sure, go ahead. I'm curious to get your thoughts. I mean, I've sort of done a separate couple of videos on this this week. But the news that broke on Tuesday morning in the form of an 8K was that the SoFi Bank president, Chad Borton, who had been with the company since the start of SoFi Bank, when they purchased Pacific uh, Golden Pacific Bank Corp in 2021, uh, he just announced his resignation effective April 12th, I believe. And this comes just two weeks after Aaron Webster, who for Webster, he was replaced as the chief risk officer, essentially demoted. A month later, Alex Chris was posting saying that he joined PayPal. And I think we all couldn't justify that move, uh, just being in you know an office job ourselves. If we were demoted in our job, like obviously we'd look for something else. But two weeks later, then you have the SoFi Bank president. He's going to be succeeded by the VP who's going to move up to that role. And... People were saying, or I guess that let me present the positive and the negative. The negative case is to say you have two major executives who are leaving within two weeks of each other. Like what is going on on this leadership team? Are we losing confidence here? Because I think the thing that I mentioned in my video was that as more of these key executives leave, the execution risk increases for you to hit that price target. Because if these are in fact the people who are gonna take you there, like if Anthony Noto left, for example, the SoFi bull case would really be at risk. If Elon left Tesla, the bull case would really be at risk, so on and so forth, because these are the people that you're essentially betting on. Um, now, I'm not saying Chad Borden is one of those people, but he did in fact, uh, you know, had success with SoFi Bank. The other side of it is, you know, people leave companies all the time and it's not really gonna be that big of a deal. Um, you have to keep in mind as well that the timing is not some conspiracy theory or power struggle at the very highest level. It's just when the RSUs vested, people are waiting for their stocks to vest and then they leave after that. Curious what you guys make of it. So it was my understanding, I think Vadim wrote a post on this. Um, so I apologize, I can't find it right now, but if I get this wrong, um, but that Chad Borden had came out of retirement to be in this role for SoFi. Uh, and then ended up, you know, doing the, or, or, you know, going through the bank licensing process in the hardest of times. And the original candidate was actually the vice president for yeah. this role that is now actually taking the primary uh, presidential role for the, for SoFi bank. So, in my understanding, this is exactly probably what they had planned behind closed doors, that he'll stay here until his options vest. Uh, he'll get the bank up and running with all his expertise and get shadowed by this person who is going to take over next. And we're watching that unfold. And it's just happening in the same sort of similar week as Aaron Webster. And so people are pointing fingers going, oh my God, is the whole C-suite jumping ship? And it's like... An Yes, I believe that people are making bets on the full C-suite of uh, SoFi. Um, but really, I'd be scared if Chris LaPointe left or if Noto left. Everyone right. else, oh, yeah. I'm not too worried. Yeah, and I think Borton, I mean, he, he's pretty impressive. You know, but I, I agree with you. I think that, that, you know, what you pointed out, that this is always a plan, that there would be that, that sort of transition at some point. I would be... 
not I would also be a little cautious. I want to throw Derek White out there. Uh, I think he's done a phenomenal job with Galileo. Um, Miguel Santos, uh, perhaps as well from Technosis. Um, I think that those are key guys. Um, yep. So Borton leaving is not bullish. Like <laughs> I'm not going to say that. And Aaron Webster, it's harder to get a read on him, but the bank has done very well. So it's not amazing, but I think that he's he was here for a, a finite season. He's done what he needed to do, and he was ready to hand over the reins. Don't know that for sure. Uh, but yeah, like if Noto left, it'd be like, man, I got to rethink this. <laughs> Honestly, Chris LaPointe, a little bit less so. CFO is still very important, especially for a stock like SoFi. Uh, but uh, we'll have to see. So two things on that. Uh, number one, I want to bring up always Testy's comment. Uh, Chad Borton was also an Army Ranger. Noto and him are friends. He brought him in to get things up to speed. So if we subscribe to this idea that Borden came out of retirement specifically to help SoFi get the bank up and running, and it's totally a plausible case, I think when they were doing the due diligence after the fact, when Borton left, they were looking at his offer letter and the actual uh, clauses in his offer letter and how that's different from uh, somebody like Noto or LaPointe or whatever in terms of the exit clauses and and just trying to gauge from that whether it was temporary, like whether the language was there. What I didn't like, so the first point is, do we think that he, like if he left retirement to set up SoFi Bank and now he's leaving SoFi Bank, the underlying assumption is that SoFi Bank is set up. It's at a place where it's self-sustaining now, it can run, like all of the setup hardship is over and it can be you know it doesn't need chad borton anymore he's fulfilled his duty to set that up so that's one point the second point is just the <clears throat> the main thing that i was worried about was the language in the 8k which basically said that he's looking to pursue other opportunities because if this was somebody that came out of retirement and news comes out next week or two weeks from now that you know, he went to, I don't know, PayPal, let's say, or, or whatever else, that wouldn't obviously be a great look. That would be perceived much worse. Or that could have been just boilerplate language that was put there and doesn't mean anything. And he's actually just going to go back into retirement. Uh, so those are the two observations that I had is obviously if this was an amicable sort of split and he just felt like he fulfilled his duty, then what that tells us is Noto and the executive team at SoFi think that the bank is fully set up to be self-sustaining and, and running from now on, that we don't need Chad Borton services anymore. The other guy, Paul Mayer, is fully ramped up and you know we're good to go. But if he does show up at another company in a couple of weeks, then I'm going to be you know, more upset than I currently am, I guess. I mean, that's, um, that's kind of the nature of, of this it's we're not living in in the 1950s or 60s where guys would start up things and then just stick with it the rest of their life or, or come in and work for 40 years um a lot of these high performing executives are there for like five years six years ten years maybe uh, but that's kind of stretching it and borton you know if you look at his impeccable resume it's the same thing uh, just it's how it's done uh and rarely unless you are the founder uh and even in those cases sometimes uh does it deviate from that? So even if he got a job elsewhere, it's fine. You know, uh, he may have just had that finite role and they said, Hey, we think that we're ready to hold, hand off the reins. And it could have been a situation where they said, if you're looking for another job, you know, we'll just keep moving out the date. But when you find something, you know, we'll announce your resignation because uh, you've done a, an impeccable job. And, and he has, uh, and, but that, that is boilerplate language. Uh, pursue other opportunities. I've seen that from somebody getting a different job to, uh, them being fired uh, to retirement. It just, it's like the most vanilla of reasons that somebody can leave. So I wouldn't read too much in that. Just going on. Um, Tanner, what's SoFi's excuse for Robinhood having a better credit card option? What What's the entire industry's excuse? Every single bank and every single credit issuer for Robinhood having a better uh, card than them. One thing I'll say, and then I want your guys' opinion, is that SoFi's credit card, they could be offering uh, friggin' 0% cash back or 10% cash back. Regardless, 
their default rates are so high that it's not even remotely a profitable product for them. Um, This idea that Robinhood has made this product that is going to excel is not something that we know yet. That uh, I hope it does. And, And as a consumer, I think that it's a perfect product. But as an institution, we truly don't know the answer. 3% 3% cash back is an unruly high uh, percent cash back that is not uh, you know, offered by many. Like for example, PayPal offers it, but only if you end up choosing their PayPal checkout options. Why? Because they make money on the checkout side and they also make money on the interchange side from the card, which makes it high enough for it to be profitable. 3% cash back on all purchases everywhere, that'll be very hard to be profitable on a purchase basis. On the balance side, I sure hope that they have their their numbers right in terms of uh, the customers that they're bringing on, the FICOs that they're not asking for, and all of this stuff. I truth truthfully, I'm not trying to bash Robinhood. I wish them the utmost success. You know, fintech to the win. Let's let's give better products to the consumers. But it is too early to tell. There's been lots of revolutionary products that have come out in in the lines of credit that have just ended up not working. So we will see. Do we want to go into more details on that here, or do we want to do that in after hours? Uh, up to you. We can talk um, some after hours. Absolutely, just so everybody can. So I'm I'm a, I'm the Robin Hood investor here. I, Tanner, you've not developed a position yet, but I know that you you like what the company's doing, and oh, yeah. we all love the product. As a consumer, like I'm getting that gold card. By the way, referral code, putting it right there. <laughs> Because I, I really do think it's a neat, uh, really good product. Uh, so it just went to one of you guys, whatever. The other one blocked out. Uh, it, it's it's awesome for a consumer. But you're absolutely right that we will need time to see if it's actually awesome for Robinhood, the business. Now, what I think is going on here, re- reading what, what Vlad had said, there's a couple of pieces. First, this card, I think the main driver and main force of this is Yes, they hope to make some money off of it, but they would really like to grow their gold subscriptions, which it absolutely will, and uh, monthly active users and, and just users in general on the Robinhood platform, which it absolutely will. Mission accomplished. The question is, what is the price of that? If they lose, you know, they, they have not quite seven billion in cash. If it ends up costing them because of charge offs, three billion of that in a year. Well, probably not a year, but uh, a couple of years, not worth it. Like, it's terrible. Uh, they'd have to bring on a lot of people. I don't know that that's going to happen. My concern with it is a phenomenal launch. The actual way that they presented it, Tevis and I talked about this. I know you talked about it too, Tanner. Uh, just impeccable presentation. The way they, they roll out and they integrate these products. They have other things going on too, the 1% match. We won't talk too much about it here, maybe after hours. But uh, my, my main concern with it is, not the three percent. I think that they can afford that. The interchange rates, uh, you know, they benefit from that. There is a piece on that, by the way, with Visa and Mastercard doing the settlement on a lawsuit that might actually lower interchange rates. Um, so we don't know for sure that they're going to get that one point five five percent or what piece of it they get. There's a lot of moving parts here. Um, only one of the the rewards that's if they cash out specifically and they put it on Robinhood's platform and then they they remove that as far as cash really hurts Robinhood. But I think that they're trying to make some, you know, Vlad mentioned he's trying to get uh, revenue from the gold, which looks like it's going to raise from 5 to six ninety nine. Uh, from what I'm saying, there's not been a formal announcement, but you see that in, in the terms and agreements. A few people see that as well. So it's kind of like paying an annual fee. You just get a lot more with the Robinhood gold. Uh, but uh, they're trying to make some money off the lending too. Now, average rates for credit cards, I, I think it's 23.5%, 23 point something percent right now quite, quite high in the United States. Uh, the variable rate uh, for Robinhood is up to 29.99%. Uh, so maybe it's a slightly higher than that. They're gonna Not everybody pays off their balance in full. You should, by the way, if you're getting the Robinhood gold card, please pay off your rates in full. You'll profit from it immensely. It'll cost me as a shareholder. Do that. Enjoy, you know? But uh, no, it, they'll be making money off of that. The, the big question is, will they be making more money off of the interest than the write-offs and the charge-offs? Uh, and I don't know. Like, nobody can answer that. I do know that they have, They and uh, I'm glad Vlad actually mentioned this in one of the interviews, that they brought over Diego Cerulli from Nubank. Uh, Tanner, you and I have talked about Nubank, and I asked you specifically, I'm like, how do they handle, I knew a little bit of this, but you filled in the blanks, uh, credit card risk or uh, really... Uh, default risk 
in a place where they don't have FICO scores. Now, this is a card, the X1 card, it, it doesn't use FICO scores. It looks at actual income. Uh, and they have an algorithm that also assesses risk as well. We don't know for sure how Robinhood will do that. I think we might get more information from our interview from Vlad here in a week or two. Can I give um, a piece on that real quick? Yeah, yeah. I, I would love for you to share on that. That it was funny that whenever they did the presentation that the guy said he's making $150,000, which I sure hope it's more if he's the product lead, but... Um, uh, he said he made $150,000 and then they instantly approved him and gave him $20,000 of credit limit. That is not the new bank way. <laughs> so that's not the capital one way or the new bank way or where, uh, you know, that sort of style is from. So they're not taking all his advice. I promise you that. So we'll see. Yeah. And, and Vlad had mentioned was, I don't know if it's Vlad uh, or the other executive that shared, but they would like to see, most almost every gold member be able to qualify for this card now we don't know what that means that might mean that some people that have like very sketchy credit and they're able to see of course the mark what they have on robin hood they're able to see the income that people have so it's not just like hey we're going to give everybody like twenty thousand dollars they might give somebody that's a little riskier like a thousand bucks now that's that's not a high limit i don't know that you know tevis and i we talked about this that in latin america that'd be great uh, in the United States, that's a really small amount that's kind of hard to use, frankly. Uh, but uh, they could do that and build from there. Maybe that's what they mean. If they give almost, if they give like 90% of people $20,000 limit uh, within seconds, I have concerns as a shareholder. But the great thing for me is I'm just in leaps through January 2025. The downside risk of this really isn't going to come into play this year. Uh, people don't instantly... Uh, have write-offs on their credit card. Uh, so I, I think that there's a lot of upside in the stock. I am slightly optimistic towards this working out for Robinhood. Um, I don't think it's just hope in the sky. I've, I've looked at a lot of different things with this. Uh, there's a lot of details. We just don't know uh, whether or not it will work, but there is some mm -hmm. risk. And if you're a Robinhood shareholder, I think it's a mistake to ignore that completely because they could be losing money on this. And if they do, you know, that's not even necessarily bearish for Robinhood. It just depends how many of those actually convert uh, to the Robinhood trading platform and who are, who are using Robinhood Gold? They do have an escape clause like most companies do of this nature in their rewards program that it's either 45 days or 60 days that they can notify people and say, hey, we are uh, changing our terms. So some have postulated that that's what's happening, that they're using this as a hook to get people initially, and then they will change the terms and, and make it so that it's instead of 3%, like 3% in these categories, but it's 2% in most whatever so, like they can change that yeah because i think right now like robin hood has been having a hard time breaking profitability any company like this is what people have a really hard time stomaching is that they whatever the company puts out as a product means that that is like the best product it's like why do we think that no other company has come out and has offered 5% APY, 3% cash back, 1% deposit, 3% on IRAs. Uh, like, it's freaking expensive, okay? And with Robinhood's ability to, uh, you know, they're starting to break profitability again, but lowest lowest rates for, for buying stocks, lowest rates for buying or, or sorry, slightly, almost the lowest rate for buying options, uh, one of the lowest rates for buying crypto, your margin is paper thin. Now you start playing with credit, okay? Credit can fluctuate in terms of its default rates. I, I, it's just, it's not guaranteed to me that Robinhood walks out of here being the winner. I can guarantee you guys that you guys walk out being the winners as consumers. It's yes. like, I would switch over everything in a heartbeat to have those types of rates everything but even if they get everyone switching over like chamath just did their uh did did anyone see this their um uh what, what do you call it the all-in podcast and he goes like can i bring over five billion dollars are they going to give me you know like are they going to give me uh five million dollars as a sign up bonus well here's the thing on the one percent the one percent i think was a thing of genius because the cost of acquisition like if if they did this like they've done in the past or like most people do for the matches 50 million. Uh, and even SoFi does this, you get that up front 
usually there's a lockup period. So your money is not your money. You know, it is, but if you leave early, you'll, you'll lose it. They do that with the IRA, the 3% match over five years. And you have to be subscribed for gold for a year. Um, the way they did this instead is they give you that 1%, but it's over 24 installments, one for each month. It's not compounding on itself. And so they will give that to you. And that, so absolutely Chamath will get that, but he's going to get one twenty fourth of that every single month. So it breaks up the cost That's of acquisition. Fine. It doesn't make it less expensive. Well, they, they make, uh, they, they yield 1% on their, um, on their cash sweeps. And so they, they'll make, uh, double that, double the cost over two years from the cash. Yeah, but, but then, but th that's perfectly fine. But you were making that rate with or without that bonus. So you've cut your margin. Yeah, but the more you've cut your margin, yes, lower margins, but higher volume. So mm -hmm. this is like the Tesla, going back to the Tesla argument, they're selling more vehicles, you know, for, for a specific purpose and reason The the margin costs are not going to be forever. And, and I, I think that Vlad realizes that this is really the time to go for it. Um, that they have plenty of cash. I don't think they're going to be cash burning. I, I don't think the cost of acquisition, because of the way they're structuring this 1%, which doesn't come out till May anyway, um, is going to hurt them right away. Uh, UK, there's some expense there, you know, with, with these certain things, but they're absolutely printing cash. Um, that's ramping as interest rates are high, as uh, crypto is just going to the moon day after day, as we're in this crazy bull market, options, everything is just really, really good. Like everything's lining up almost perfectly for Robin Hood. There's risk longer term, but on this time he's, he's realizing like, Hey, we can still make money acquiring customers. I don't know if that's true with the credit card, but with the 1% for sure it is. Uh, and as they see what our platform is able to do, as we roll out these better things for user interface, as we improve Robin Hood gold, uh, people realize like, Hey, this is the platform to be on. And yeah. So after two years, will some like Chamath with the $5 billion leave and go elsewhere? Sure. He for sure will. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of people who look at Robin and say, you know, what? I've, I've tried it. I've sampled the goods and I don't want to go back to, well, TD Ameritrade doesn't exist anymore, but Schwab or, or whoever they're using, Thinkorswim, you know, the great options, uh, Webull. <laughs> I mean, Webull has better rates. Uh, we Tevis and I looked at this as well, that almost every offer that Robinhood is doing, Webull is actually higher. Um, I don't know how they're able to do that. Maybe they're burning cash uh, on those uh, sort of things, but people are not talking about Webull the same way. Why? It's because Robinhood is just frankly better uh, as a uh, as a broker. Look, at the end of the day, I think we've analyzed this thing to death over the past week, in individually and as a group. There's a million ways that this can go right. There's a million ways that this can go wrong. We don't have any numbers. All we have is what the announcement is. Don't forget that Robinhood is also partnering with a bank that the bank is also yeah. taking on some of this risk on top of things. And so, so you can talk about SoFi, SoFi's short interest or people resigning for the business from like 30 minutes. We start talking about another stock and he's like, we can go back and forth. <laughs> yeah, I... Uh... So Mm -hmm. I, I want to add on, like, if you're not done, Tavis, we can play chat. Add on. Oh, so I'll, I'll add on real quick. Yeah, the bank um, that the Robinhood is going with, they actually don't take on risk. It's CCBX um, is as banking as a service. Looking at their 10K, their charge off rates on their credit platforms for their customers, these are people like Robinhood, was 14 point something percent. Not good. Not good at all. And they mentioned, that with all of their customers, except for one, all their clients, uh, their clients assumed 100% of the risk as far as charge-offs. I'm guessing th uh, that the interchange rate mostly belongs to Robinhood as a result of that, uh, but uh, we don't know for sure. There was one exception. They, they had one client where they shared 10% of the risk with, and because of that, they tightened their lending standards. And so they're like, hey, Robinhood, if you want to go nuts, and lend, lend uh, or not lend, uh, but uh, issue cards to people that don't deserve it, and you want a 14% charge-off rate, that's great for us. We don't care. Uh, we'll make money off of you. So there is a risk, uh, especially with the comments that Vlad has said. We don't really know how it's going to play out. The 3% is not the problem. It's the charge-offs. My guess as far as what happens is that this is probably going to be close to revenue neutral um, over the long term. Well, so... Um, Look, it's it okay. Either they invite everybody and their mother and they lose money on it, 
or they just have a huge influx. And by all indications, early indications, they're having a huge influx of an unbelievable uh, influx, like insane amount. I think it sounds I'm, like more people have signed up for this in the last week than anyone has signed up for SoFi's credit card. Oh, absolutely. Anybody, you know, for SoFi's credit. but like it, it, it sounds like more people are going to be signing up for this from now until SoFi reports earnings and probably SoFi is going to get total members this quarter. Um, so hundreds of thousands of, of signups and that's great. Either they're going to lose money on these people or they're going to make money somehow on these people, because if they're not going to be scrutinous around the FICOs and around the ability to repay, then the chances are that they're going to lose more money, right? Like just logically speaking, if they do make money on these people by having the brokerage side of the business, cover the cost by having it as a loss leader by, you know, whatever the method may be. One quarter later, everybody else is going to copy that exact. It's going to it's going to reach parity, right? Like, am I am I just blind for for saying that? You know, so Robinhood finds a way to offer three percent and, and you know one percent unlimited uh, deposit and all of these amazing benefits, and they can do it profitably, and they don't have to set like rigorous credit limits. Fidelity is going to jump right on that. SoFi is going to jump right on that. All of these people are going to jump right on that to figure out, okay, how did they make money on this? Oh, cool. Let's just copy, paste, do the same thing. And as a result of that, from a benefits perspective, it's going to reach parity over the next six months to a year because Robinhood will have validated that that model is viable. I, I have yeah. some opinions on that, but let's uh, let's talk about that on the SoFi Weekly or the After Hour Show. Let, let me just mention here, like, uh, I don't think SoFi should chase this. They should see how it plays out. If it works well for Robinhood, yeah, absolutely emulate that. They have a, as far well, they're, as consumers they're, are concerned. Let's not pardon? forget what Anthony Inoto said on uh, yeah. on the Kathy Wood thing. Stay oh, in man. your lane. Yes. Yes. He's not chasing. Yeah. No, he, he yes, yeah, stay in your lane. Um, so I was like a direct thing at Robinhood. Now, did you, you heard the challenge uh, as well that, that the Visa CEO mentioned? uh in context that sounded very sofi-esque one-stop shop that's what he called robin hood so well, you know my it's funny my dream was that these companies would you know back a year ago like merge together and be this unbeatable giant and that's not going to happen realistically they are in competition with some segments um usually what robin hood does well is not competing with sofi and vice versa very different companies in that way but there's a little beef here. I kind of like it, even though I'm shareholders of both. Uh, we'll have to see how it plays out. But I, I I don't mind SoFi sitting on the sidelines and just saying, hey, we're not going to necessarily chase this. Like if they offered 3% with the trouble they've had with the charge-offs, that would be terrible, actually. Let's go to the after-hour show. I cannot stress enough that I have no time. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you guys want to join the After Hours show, there's a join button down below, uh, either on Tevis or myself's channel. Uh, it is five bucks a month, but it's worth it. Every single dollar. Don't be poor. Give us money. <laughs> okay, goodbye. <laughs>